Hello everyone. Um, so another vlog style video this week. We're, um, an MCU one at that. I've generally been since the MCU stuff has started back up again. Um, with the uh, WandaVision and Falcon of the Winter Soldier video, I've been getting I've been doing videos for those on top of my in movie screening stuff. So, uh, I'm going to get my thoughts on Loki, season one, because we're getting a season two, which is, which is awesome. I'm going to do a no spoiler section at the front, and then, uh, and then I will get into some spoilerific stuff from there. I'm not going to give like blow by blow or anything like that, but I want to get into that, some stuff. So, Loki is a show which, like, I'm going to put this back up for a second. As I mentioned with my WandaVision and uh, my Falcon and the Winter Soldier reviews, Marvel movies, and this has been the case with the TV shows have, as well, have always kind of done... The thing of putting something else in the context of a superhero work. Captain America and the Winter Soldier was a um, sort of your Robert Redford 1970s um, parallax view or um, that sort of thing. Dustin Hoffman and Marathon Man. That sort of Thriller. I mean, yes, I know that Redford wasn't in the Parallax view. Redford was in a different, similar conspiracy thriller, but it's this kind of movie in the 70s where you think Redford, when you think Dustin Hoffman, when you think of lots of other similar actors, like, oh, and conspiracy thrillers. You think, you think conspiracy thrillers. If you're not thinking um, road movies that end in sudden outbursts of violence that kill off all the cast, Raising Bull, um, you think of like these conspiracy thrillers, and such is most certainly the case with Captain America and the Winter Soldier. I mean, yes, you do have more clear cut, straightforward superhero, like just pure superhero movies, um, like with like the actual the Avengers type movies with the Avengers in the title. But when you start branching off to individual characters, they start getting more into their own thing, and. Loki definitely fits into that category, but it's not its not necessarily as straightforward to pin down as some of the other shows. In the sense that... In the sense that, like... It's not, like... It's not the way that WandaVision started out as a sitcom pastiche and slowly over time adjusted itself and turned itself into a sort of David Lynchian um, sort of, not to say deconstruction of um, the, oh, yeah, kind of like semi-commentary. If David Lynch was, if you were to bring David Lynch into the Marvel Cinematic Universe and say, hey, do something. We trust you. Just go. Um, we're giving you Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, and the Vision in a domestic suburban setting. Go. We'll probably get something like Wanda Vision. Not exactly that. He would certainly do his own thing. But I said, here's your context. Start from here. Go on from there. Um, that would not be an unreasonable to, that you would get that. It would be get so, that you would get something like one division, but going off in a very very different direction. Um, in the alternate universe where this happened, if you will. Um, in this case, however, both of those shows are establishing character beats and po and status quo post Avengers Endgame. Loki is working at a more 
universal level. We know, we have known coming into this series, that parallel universes and alternate timelines were very much going to be a part of like this big up of this upcoming chunk of the MCU. Not all of it. Shang Chi is its own thing. It is not, and there, from what we see in the advertisements, we don't have parallel universe branching stuff there. Um. But like as much as we have uh, Black Widow and Falcon of the Winter Soldier to a degree setting up little bits of what will be the Dark Avengers, um, what is implied what is implied could be the Dark Avengers or the Thunderbolts, we have here going and go, okay. We know we're getting Doctor Strange to the Multiverse of Madness. We know we're getting Spider-Man No Way Home and they're doing parallel universe stuff there, and we know we're getting What If, and What If is being explicitly talking about parallel universes. So, th and we also know that some parallel universe stuff is coming up with, and time travel stuff is coming up with Ant-Man and the Wasp th um, 3, or Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. So like, okay, Loki is, getting, is involving the TVA. The Time Variance Authority, a thing and a group that deals with timeline weirdness and that sort of stuff. Um, that was in the comics. It's clearly shown in the promotional materials and everything that that's what's going on here. This is where we put our dip our toe in the water. And I think they do a very adroit job of setting, without getting the spoilers, of setting this up, of using the series. To basically, to an extent, say, here's why we didn't necessarily have that much time travel weirdness before, but now that we've gotten into some time travel stuff with the time heist in Endgame, and we're introducing more and more of this here, this is our way of opening the gates. I'm saying, okay, this is an available framework to tell stories. Now, it is not... What this could have been, to a degree, is like Time Tunnel or Doctor Who or something like that. And it's not that. Um, it's not that at all. But, like, I could almost see with, like, season two, with, like, season two being in a weird way, sort of MCU meets Doctor Who with Loki, of all people, as the Doctor kind of situation. But not necessarily, like, particularly with the parallel universes involved, maybe if, like, put this, they just, like, there's a throwaway line. Now they mentioned, oh, yeah, we have a time ship kind of thing or a parallel universe ship, but it's not done. Um... And I'll say this thought, like this line doesn't have a payoff here, but it feels like a throwaway thing of, oh, we can possibly introduce this in a later season and use this in a later season if, um, but yeah, yeah, it, it feels like a setup line to throw away some, to think we're okay, we're going to toss this out there for season two, we've got it set up for when we need it, that sort of thing. And that's kind of the vibe I got from this show is like, okay, we are setting, we are setting things up to be not to be paid off later. Um, and some of this is probably is definitely going to be paid off in season two. There's a lot of cliffhanger elements with the end of the season. There's a lot of questions that are still kind of unanswered. And there are some significant characters who are very much in the wind in a way that is feels much more of a and we will get a resolution for this in Season 2, as opposed to we will get a resolution for this in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Or we will get a resolution for this in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, or What If, or that sort of thing. So there's that going on out there. And acting performances wide, everyone here is great. This cast is a murderer's row of really great actors. Um, in all sorts of wonderful roles. I mean, Tom Hiddleston has always been great as Loki, and this role is no exception. Um, I, in fact, I think like, this is probably one of his best Loki performances. In Not Loki, but you know what I mean. He, he also has his Loki moments, if you will, but his, 
I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Um, but it had like, his very strong performances. Let's him, it lets him do stuff with this character over time in a way that he that he hasn't been able to in the Thor movies. In the Thor movies, he has always been in some form or another second fiddle to Thor. He has been a second fiddle to Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth also really great actor. Um, but there's all and they've always had great chemistry together, but there's always been this sense of the Thor movies of Tom Hiddleston comes in, steals the scene for a bit, hands it back off to, to Chris Hemsworth, and then Chris Hemsworth is the main focus of the of the rest of the scene. And so forth and so on. Everything else is but 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 he never really had a chance to, to just inhabit a scene and spend significant portions of time just playing out with his character in the way he has here. And he is just does a wonderful job. There's a great bit in just the very first episode where we have the Loki from who escaped with the Tesseract from the time heist, who has escaped with the Tesseract but captured by the TVA, and he's getting he's basically getting shown his character arc from the past few Mar from the, the the Marvel movies of the past, and he basically ends up going through a lot of his character development from this time as he sees the growth of himself and realizes that and through the, like seeing it through this through the the images of their movies like actually like by the end Loki like this is the person I want to be but I also don't want to get killed by Thanos. And that basically like, dramatically starts the path of him changing the arc of his character over the course of this series and lets this series start more or less with Loki at the place he was at character-wise at Avengers Infinity War and then gives the ability for him to develop from there something that because he got because he got killed in Infinity War he didn't get that other great members of the cast um Owen Wilson as Mobius M Mobius and I got, I'm glad he's coming back for season like we are getting him for season 2 um because this is a series that involves parallel universes and alternate timelines um I will say that Mobius M. Mobius, like, like saying he's going to be in season two is actually not a spoiler for this season in terms of him being a coming out of this alive or dead, because again, time travel and parallel universes are involved. Um, oh, we also, um, the members of the cast, we have, um, we have, uh, I'm going to mispronounce character names, and I deeply apologize for actor names. I deeply apologize for these actors for that. Um, uh, some of these cases, these are names which I have, which I am looking at and reading, but I have had not heard them pronounce themselves, and so I have not been able to train myself to hear them pronounced um, and pronounce them accordingly myself. So, Gugu Mambratha Ra as Ravana Renslayer, who's basically the um he like head judge of the TVA is also excellent she she is for lack of a better term the chief that she's the person who uh Mobius re um answers to and who is over there in charge of their buddy cop dynamic and with Mobius and Loki kind of having like they're they're they are they are a buddy cop dynamic but it's a different style of buddy cop dynamic or buddy action series dynamic than say we got with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This is much more of like 70s TV show, 70s movie. Um think like getting back to Redford again, like Redford and Hoffman in all the presidents. Like that kind of character dynamic. Like these are characters like, they have like they have an act. They have action scenes together, but there's just as much time of like 
people sitting down and talking over their lunch or while poring over files and that sort of thing. Um, it is a character dynamic bait where their big dialogue interplay scenes are not action banter dialogue, but um, characters working on on intellectual um, problems. That sort of situation is how I'd put it. Um, all this is borne out, by the way. I'm going to get to this in a bit before I finish going over the cast. Um, or at least the non-spoilerific members of the cast. Um, with the set design and production style. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, other notable cast, really great casting stuff. Um, Sofia DiMartino as Sylvie, or the female Loki variant, um, who is being hunted down at the start of the series, is also excellent. Uh, she is an actress who I had not seen in anything before this, but this is definitely in a case of, okay, now that I am familiar, so I've seen her perform, and um, I've enjoyed, and her work in the show is very good. If I see her in something else, I will definitely consider checking it out. Going over her casting list, uh, her like noted credits on Wikipedia, <clears throat> a lot of this is, well, your, your BBC television series. Uh, she was in, she like she was on an episode of Spooks Spooks spinoff uh, spinoff uh, or MI five as it's known in the US. Um, she was in an episode of Midsummer Murders. Um, admittedly, considering the number of episodes that there are of that show and that it's a murder mystery show with let's just say Midsummer the town of Midsummer has a higher body turnover than St Mary's Mead or. Um, whatever the hell the town from Murder, She Wrote is, Cabot Cove, um, that, that, like, Midsummer, like, Midsummer, like, her being an episode of Midsummer Murders, I'm not gonna say it's not saying much, it's like being on an episode of CSI, um, it's, it's, it's nice, you get to see them in an episode of CSI, but also, there is a not unreasonable chance that they are either playing a, they're a guest episode of CSI, they are playing either a murder victim, a murderer, or maybe a uh, ex maybe they're lucky. They're playing an expert source who the characters will talk to and will thus be able to appear again in a later episode, but not necessarily likely. Uh, but lots of it's lots of just neat credits there. I hope that like this opens up a whole bunch of new acting and casting doors for her because she she was great in this show. She has some really good performances in this, and I love to see more. Um, Other roles of note. We have two members of the cast of uh, uh, of uh, Lovecraft of the um, multi-time Emmy Award-winning series Lovecraft Country. Uh, here with again, apologize for mispronouncing name. Uh, Wunmi Mosaku as um, playing Hunter B fifteen. Um, really great character, has a really great character dynamic over the course of the show, as she is, like, particularly with, like, both her as the Hunter B-15, Owen Wilson as Mobius, both playing off of Loki and off of each other, where, like, they have this character dynamic of, um... Mobius is like, nah, nah, Loki's on to something. You gotta listen to him. You gotta trust us. Trust me on this. I, 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 I trust Loki to, to Loki's judgment on this. And besides, if we, if he turns out to be pulling a trip, we can just, we can just, uh, you know, kill him right there with the, or, um, wipe him from the timeline right there. From, like, and Moby and Hunter people too. Like, oh, I don't try. He's the god of lie. Like, he's called Loki Lie Smith, and God, like doesn't actually just like say that, but it's like, uh huh. Look, this guy, like, I don't trust him. I'm having none of Loki's crap. I'm not putting my putting my neck on the line for that schmuck. And I certainly don't trust him to not get me killed. <clears throat> and you get this great character arc on from there. And it is, it is wonderful. 
Peter Morphle. And also, um, Hera Strong has a wonderful voice performance as the animated character of Miss Minutes, um, the mascot for uh, the TVA. And I will just say, um, we'll get in. Actually, I will get more into Miss Minutes in the set in the the spoiler half of the show. Uh, this this review. This is this is already twenty minutes already, but I I do want to get into some spoiler stuff. Well, I'll get, I will get into t into Tara Strong in the spoiler section. A uh, last bit I want to get into. Um, Richard D. Grant's casting was announced already. I went to this thing. Oh, he's going to be in the show. I will, all I will say is, with the exception of one other actor whose performance I will get into this, in the spoiler section, Richard E. Grant's performance when I saw him in episode five was like, oh, he's already gotten. He came into this show with an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Uh, for, for admittedly for a film I have not seen, but having seen Richard E. Grant in plenty of other things before this, I am well aware of. Grant's bona fides as an actor, and I recognize that he is he's one of those actors where he's been floating around genre works for a very long time, and you've seen him in on Doctor Who and various other things like in Star Trek. I think he's done some Star Trek stuff. Like I know who this guy is. He's really good. He been overlooked for big acting award for the big acting awards like the Oscars for so long. So him getting the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor was great. And when I came in and when I watched episode five, uh, five of the show, I came away with like particularly looking at like the number of awards that Marvel shows got uh, or nominations Marvel shows got from uh, the Emmys. I came with this going. You know. Honestly, Richard E. Grant. I could see him next year. Getting halfway to the get, getting hit on the halfway mark to the EGOT. Um, he hasn't gotten like for the Oscar plus possibly getting an Emmy for best guest for um, best guest actor. Only reason, only thing that stopped me, like, like where it made me change my mind at all, is not because I reevaluated his performance, but because of our performance in the last episode surpassed that, in my opinion. And finally, before I get into the spoiler stuff, production design. The Marvel Assembled show, which is their behind-the-scenes thing they put on Disney+, Plus for a Loki Season 1 hasn't come out yet. But I, my suspicion I got from this is that this show did a bunch of stuff on the volume. If you've seen, if you've seen The Mandalorian, you're familiar, or seen, maybe seen the making of stuff with The Mandalorian, you are familiar with the volume. It is a soundstage that is designed to have rear projection screens with um, real-time digital images created using like a real engine and that sort of thing in it. It gives the actors things to actually react to on set. It, lets you, it also handles adaptive lighting and that sort of thing so that what the, the lighting in the backdrop also reflects the lighting on the characters, preventing a degree of break of um, a suspension of disbelief maintains a sense of aramicitude. And again, also gives the actor something to react to. They are reacting. If you see a ship coming towards you and you're on the volume, you see something coming towards you as opposed to, okay, you see that taped X, the, that X and white tape on the screen, react, react at that. There's a spaceship coming towards you. Um... I've got some concept art over here if you want to see it. We admit we may redesign this later, but it approximately looks like this. That sort of thing. That's the way it was that's the way they did it in the past. Disney has the volume technology now. There's a bunch of stuff I suspect was done there. And I think that's a smart move and handled well and lets them do things that would be otherwise very difficult to do with live action actors with this sort of setup. With the sorts of like going through the various alien planets and alternate timelines and the future and the past on a television budget starts getting a little pricier there. The BBC is able to get away with some of this stuff on Doctor Who because oftentimes they are relying 
on things that the BBC has lying around or has immediate access to because they're the BBC. To put things another way, to make an example, the BBC do having the doctor time travel to Edwardian England is not necessarily a significant cost outlay because you have a bunch of Edwardian England cost Britain costumes around. You have manners from the period um, that you like that you've used previously for, for example, shooting Downton Abbey, and you have access to all of that and can just go from there. That sort of thing. Uh, it reduces your cost outlay. Like, I would not be shocked if, for example, when um, they did the Doctor Who episode where they went to ancient Rome, that they grabbed basically a, a bunch of stuff that they kept around from Rome, which was, a, which was yes, an HBO series, but it was also a BBC co-production um, for some of that. So, um, that was, that worked really well. The general aesthetic of the TVA is great. It is, it has the sort of dated 1950s, 60s architectural futurism style to it, but without getting into the brutalism, getting as fully into the brutalism as something like, for example, Control does. Um, and I, again, I'm a sucker for that particular architectural style. I, when I was going to community co going to college, um, a lot of campuses I went to had that around. Particularly when I was doing, going to community college, and I guess community college had they still have some buildings with that style around. Um, Portland Community College and their Sylvania campus has a similar setup um, for several of their buildings and interiors. That particular style of futuristic brutalism and the color schemes and the sort of warm earth tones with that sort of stuff is, I have a bit of a nostalgic feel for it, not because I grew up in that time, not even close, but because I spent enough time around it to have a fondness for it. And I came up here and I dig it. So before I get into sports, I would say, I really, to wrap up, I really like the show. I am really looking forward to season two. Um, I strongly recommend checking this out. There is enough stuff that falls back on other bits from the MCU that it's like not like really heavy, but just enough that it's worth having some addition, a little additional like knowledge, like going in. Not much. Like the bits from the time heist that matter are shown. Um, but having a little bit of background on Thor and Loki um, helps, would help a little bit. Spoiler time. So, I remember I so said episode five left me going away going, oh, Richard E. Grant should be halfway to his, next year needs to be halfway to the EGOT. The thing that made me change my mind was episode six with Jonathan Majors as he who remains, um who the man behind the curtain, and who is a Kang. Or possibly a Amortis, depending on how you want to look at it. Not a Rambatut, but at least a Kang or an Amortis. Um, he, is, he steals the, the show. He, his job in the last episode is to a certain degree give a bunch of exposition of what the hell is going on, why the TVA exists, what their game is, over 20 minutes, intercutting back and forth with stuff that's going on elsewhere in the TVA with uh, Judge Renslayer, with Mobius, um, with Hunter B-15, then cutting back to him providing this exposition to Loki and to Sylvie, and he just does so well. He's this, like very engaged and energetic and confident character, which also has this very deep underlying sense of weariness and the sense that this level of confidence and wit is as much a cover up the weariness until the moment where, as he says, we have crossed the threshold and kind of the confidence melts away as he realizes that at the point where I legitimately don't know what's going to happen after this point 
it's the first time I've not known what's going to happen next in a very long time. And that is impressive and amazing. And Ob he said, like, oh, and sets up this great conflict for the last episode. And the ultimate repercussions of this are definitely play up over season two, which is okay, you kill the guy who is running the TVA, and uh, you kill you kill this you kill uh, this Kang, you kill this Immortus. There's a bunch of other Kangs and Immortuses out there who are gonna start going after this timeline and other branching timelines when this happens. What is going to come out of it? Like, so, do you kill this Kang or this Immortus or do you um, or do you what the, the, I should say is what Immortus, what, what the, he who remains suggests is, oh, what you should do is you should ally with me and take over running the TVA and then that way the other Kangs and the Morses out there don't come come in and start attacking this multiverse and come after us and multiverse of war shall shall be shall begin again. And while what what we what we're meant to take away from this is to a certain degree that like he he remained is something of a Thanos figure in the sense of he is looking at a legitimate problem and drawing the wrong conclusion based on his prejudice on his prejudices and biases. Um, Thanos say Thanos looks at problems of overpopulation, lack of resources, and the phenomenal cosmic power that the Infinity Stones can can unlock. And instead of saying I will provide the resources, he said, "Oh." I'll just kill, I'll kill people because he, because he views because in the sake of, in the case of Thanos, that is do him an easier option. Um, that, oh, that, that is an option that he, he, he considers large numbers of people to be expendable enough that, 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 That that seems a more reasonable option to him than having more of the resources and habitable worlds and arable land and prosperous food crops and that sort of thing that would be necessary to feed populations. And it's the same sort of way with with he who remains. Um he who remains looks at the other kings out there waging war on each other and goes, okay, to protect this timeline, I need to hide it from the kings. Whereas, like, and so I have to lock down this timeline rigidly without realizing maybe, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe the kings are the problem. Um, it, it's a failure to recognize themselves as the problem. And, but at the same time in the episode, they also, they pose the, 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 the tough question of history, which, um, how to put this, um, the right way to phrase this, which is when it com comes to replacing dictatorships and totalitarian systems of government, which is, Okay, you got rid of the dictator. You threw, you overthrew the oligarchy. You overthrew the, um, you overthrew the dictator. Now what comes after? And the show sets up like with the conclusion that they. He who remains puts forward that, well, if you take if you take me out without putting anything in my place, another one of me will pop in to take it to, to fill the void, and Sylvie draws the conclusion. Well, uh, when Loki says, "But hang on, we should think about this and put a plan together first. Like, oh, the alternative is put. You have to put another oligarch. You have to put another dictator. You have to put another 
fascist in that place. And because that's what the fascist and the dictator are saying, because they are unable to consider of an alternative option. And what I think, and I, my, this is my sealed envelope, I have no knowledge in the writer's room prediction for season two, is what they're going to lead up to is that no, the problem, like, the solution isn't you fit, replace the dictator with another dictator. It's when you replace the dictator, you know in advance what you want to put in there. What's You know going in what is going to take that place. You have a plan in advance. It doesn't have to be the same thing or the same type of thing. You can replace the dictatorship with the democracy. You can place the um, capitalism with socialism. But you, have, but you can't just say, okay, we're replacing the economic system or replacing the political system, we don't know with what. Question mark, question mark, question mark. We'll get to that after we've removed the old thing first. And the and what I think they're setting up for season two, starting with the conclusion here, is that if if the answer to your question of I'm going to replace it with what with is uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out later, you're going to get stuck with the same thing that you had before in some manner or another, no matter what the best of your intentions will be. And I'm anxious to see this Barbera. It's not... I've, I've seen some arguments made that this makes it fascist apology, and I disagree there, because what we've seen in history is when you don't necessarily have a plan in advance of when... You, when you replace the old government, but you haven't quite figured out, okay, the people who are replacing the old government, who are they going to replace? Who's going to be in charge? Or not even just be in charge. What's come, what next? If you don't have an answer to the question, what next? And you try and you wing it, it becomes easier for people who want the old thing, or who are supporting the old thing, or encourage the old thing to pop back in, even if there's a trans. You make it a transition period between the two, and what comes next, even if it's the old... It can be the old thing in the trappings of the new thing. Um, it can be an imperial state um, in the trappings of communism. It can be a totalitarian dictatorship in um, the trappings of democracy. It can be also... It, all sorts of other things like that. It can be, um, cap it can be a, um, very capitalist and oligarchical state in the trap, um, in the trappings of a more, of a more, of a more, um, not more, uh, the adjective is escaping me right now, but a, a more egalitarian system of the economic system, but all the old issues can still remain are are still there. So if you haven't figured out in advance, okay, here I make that to to we're going to get political here because all art is political. Um, that. Basically, what we put it is, if you're planning to redistribute wealth and haven't figured out what your mechanisms are for wealth, wealth redistribution before you decide, okay, we're going to start redistributing wealth you and redistributing power, you instead end up in a situation where you potentially have a lot of power centralized in the people responsible for the wealth dis redistribution, and it makes, and it m could make for a different level of, in the long run, a economic egalitarian class, an egalitarian, an economic oligarchical class. It might not be the same people as before, but uh, in charge, but it's a similar. It can become a similar system. Or to quote a certain certain British walk band, uh, "Meet the new boss, same as the old boss." <clears throat> but he, though, admittedly, they weren't talking about like they weren't discussing this problem with the same depth as potentially season two of um Loki will do. We'll see. That actually does lead me to the thing that I would kind of wish we like 
that that kind of Loki is doing by having a second season that Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision didn't. Is that Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision had narrative things that they still cut that still needed to be explored some more. Stuff like um Remainers versus the Returned in Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Ecodem and political systems and economic hardships related to that. Um we didn't necessarily like there wasn't necessarily a real resolution related to that there. That's still a very complicated, messy issue that other films may certainly get into, but still is a problem, but still hasn't really gotten been, been gotten into here. And the in depth and there's room to cover that in the second season, but we're getting a movie instead. But it's fine. But here with Loki getting a second season. I feel much more confident that once that having set up all these themes, um, not just narrative hooks, but dramatic and themes and narrative themes related to this, that they're going to, they hopefully are going to be able to explore them at greater length in the upcoming season, in the upcoming second season. We shall see. So, with all that out of the way, what did you think about? about Loki season 1. If you want to get into spoilers, I will request that you that to force the um YouTube comment expansion thing to do where you have to click to expand a comment that you place spoilers and then a few carriage returns below that and then start typing just so that way anyone who's casually scrolling down uh doesn't actually need to hit with spoilers. Just be good people and Mask the spoilers to the best of your ability. Um, otherwise, um, next week, or my, my next episode I'll be doing, will be getting to the Batman stuff. Um, as like that I meant, meant to do earlier, but I felt, you know, let's talk Loki. I want to talk Loki. Let's talk Loki. And so, we talk to Loki. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks. Also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 